Welcome, my name is Ronan. Hello, I'm Dave. Hello, I'm Cahal. Seamus. Mary. Gillian. Jean. Patrick. Sarah. Helen. Susan. Niall. Patricia. Jim. Magella. John. Ashlyn. Tom. Hello, I'm Elaine, and welcome to our virtual tour of the Rock of Cashel. Here on the north side of the Rock of Cashel, uh, we can see views and landscapes for miles. And one of the most dominant on this side of the site is the Sleep Blue Mountains and the Devil's Bit. Legend has it that the devil took a chunk from the Devil's Bit, spat it out, and it landed right here at the Rock of Cashel. Do you also say he took a chunk of tooth as well? Behind the gate here is St. Patrick's Well. And this is the most important feature of the site because this is what brought people here to the Rock of Cashel in the first place. What was called an artesian well, which meant the water bubbled naturally to the surface. And it was very important to have a source of water in a stone fortress as well. And it's also believed to be the site where St. Patrick baptized the last pagan king of Munster, Angus Christianity, on top of the hill here, as St. Patrick got a bowl of water out of the well for the ceremony. So all the buildings that we have here on the Rock of Cashel today um, come from the more recent history uh, from the 12th to the 15th century. Um, the history here in the Rock goes back a lot further than that. When towards the end of the 4th century, um, a king called Conal Cork decided to choose the Rock of Cashel um, as a centre of power for his kingdom of Munster. Essentially making Cashel, if you will, the capital of Southern Ireland at the time. Now, while the founding stories of Cashel often refer to lighting fires under sacred yew trees, as well as imitating stories from the Bible, um, the real reason why um, Cork would have chosen um, Cashel as its capital or centre of power is more of a practical one. And we're sitting here in the middle of the Golden Vale here um, in Munster, and you can see if you come to the rock how far you can see for miles and miles all around. Whether it be a rainy day or a sunny day, the views are quite incredible. I suppose a more practical reason, as well as being a natural fortification, made this place an obvious choice. Different members of the Oanok dynasty ruled at Cashel for over 600 years, until the 10th century influx of Vikings to Ireland. The status quo had been disturbed, and with these new rivals, families like the Oanok could be challenged more easily. One family did so successfully. They were known as the Dolgosh. They were based out of Kinkora near Killaloo in County Clare, and it is from this family we have Ireland's most famous High King, Brian Baru. Brian was crowned King here at Cashel around 978, breaking centuries of Oanach rule, and he would eventually become the first King from Munster to achieve High Kingship of Ireland, being crowned at Tara in 1002. Brian held the position of High King until he was killed at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Despite his death, the Dolgosh continued to rule in Munster, and by the 12th century, they had now adopted the surname Ibrian, or O'Brien. It is during the rule of his great-grandson, Markarthok Ibrian, that arguably the most important event in the history of Cashel would take place. Markarthok convened a synod here at Cashel in 1101, and during this event, he gifted the site to the church. So this is the Round Tower here. The Round Tower is the oldest surviving building here on the site. The Round Tower was built around maybe the start of the 12th century. Uh, it is, as I say, the oldest surviving building here on the site. And uh, the Round Tower is one of many Round Towers here in Ireland. About 60 to 70 of them have been identified so far in this country in various states of repair. And they're an example of unique native early Christian Irish architecture. They're not really found anywhere else other than Ireland. Now, round towers are always built on the grounds of religious establishments like the Rock of Cashel or monastic settlements, and there are a number of ideas or theories as to what they were used for, what the primary reason for building one was. 
So one theory was that the round towers served mainly as uh, places of refuge that could be used when a religious establishment like this was in danger. Uh, one typical feature of round towers that gave rise to this theory was the uh, was the um, uh, elevated doorway. Uh, that in the past was interpreted as, as a uh, defensive feature, but today it's more interpreted as an engineering feature, uh, adding to the stability of the building. So that uh, idea isn't as, as uh, believed as it once was, certainly not among archaeologists and historians, although still quite a popular idea. Another idea was that the round towers served mainly as beacons or focal points, tall buildings that could be seen for miles around, helping people to find a religious establishment. But the idea that most people uh, or most archaeologists and historians and so on uh, agree on today is the idea that the round towers served mainly as uh, bell towers. The Irish Gaelic word for round tower is clilcach, that means bell house. It's a word that has been around for a long time and certainly supports that idea. Here behind me is St. Patrick's Cross. Now the piece that's here standing out on the site is actually a replica. The original, made of sandstone, was moved inside in 1980 as due to the Irish weather it had been damaged. So to prevent further damage it was brought indoors. It's known as a Latin cross, which is rare to see in Ireland, so it has no circle at the top and it has supports. Unfortunately, only one support survives today. The base would have been very heavily carved on all four sides. There's labyrinth, animals, crosses and spirals. On the cross itself, facing east, is a figure of Christ, fully clothed. And on the west side, it's a figure believed to be St. Patrick, standing on an ox's head. One of the older buildings on the Rock of Cashel is Cormac's Chapel. It's a 12th century church. Its building began around about 1127 and it was completed and consecrated in 1134. Its founder and patron was King Cormac McCarthy, who was king of this part of the province in that time. And it was quite common for people like him to help out the church and provide them with land or finance if necessary. But an extra motivation for Cormac in building his chapel here on the Rock of Cashel was that ancestors of his had reigned from here, been crowned from this site when it was the fortress for the kings of Munster. Today it stands as one of the most complete and intact Romanesque chapels left in the country, studied by students of history and architecture because of that. Inside Cormac's Chapel are fragments of the oldest surviving frescoes in Ireland dating to the 1170s. Um, they're quite a sophisticated scheme um, with possible English influence. Um, the frescoes are believed to depict the visit of the uh, three Magi to King Herod. And uh, one of the interesting things about the frescoes is the pigments that were used in their creation. Um, so a lot of uh, very expensive and um, rare pigments were used. Uh, for example, uh, the blue colour that you see here is a pigment known as lapis lazuli. Um, today it's more commonly referred to as ultramarine. In the 12th century, lapis lazuli was only uh, mined in the mountains of Afghanistan. Um, so this pigment would have uh, traveled by camel or donkey along the Silk Road, um, typically as far as Syria. In Syria, then, it would be uh, loaded onto ships and transported to Venice. And uh, Venice would have been the center of trade um, for pigments uh, such as these. Um, eventually, that pigment would have made its way here to uh, the Rock of Cashel. Um, lapis lazuli is very important uh, because it was so rare in the 12th century. Um, it was more valuable than gold. And uh, this blue color has been used um, quite liberally over uh, the ceiling here in Cormac's Chapel. So we're standing at the north door, which was originally the main entrance to King Cormac McCarthy's chapel, uh, the beautiful Romanesque chapel at the Rock. You have the multi-ordered arches uh, and the pillars with different animals depicted on them and everything, uh, chevron pattern. But the main point is, I believe, the story being told on the tempanon over the door. You have a, a very large lion and it's treading on a serpent or dragon type creature. Uh, you have a centaur, which represented mythology or the old ways with a bow and arrow defending itself. And I, um, one of the theories is that the large lion represents the army of the, of the Pope, the small centaur, the Irish church or the Irish people defending itself from that large army. Uh, and it was a message that the Irish people had to show more of fealty or loyalty to the Pope in Rome and the Irish church also had to do the same. Here inside Cormac's chapel is a sarcophagus. 
and this sarcophagus was carved in the late 1120s and it was the final resting place of King Tighe McCarthy. There are only 17 sarcophagi in Ireland and this is the oldest and the only Irish made one. The other 16 examples all date to the 13th and 14th centuries and were carved by Anglo-Norman families, which makes this example unique. And you can see at the front it's carved quite ornately with Ernest style decoration and it shows two intertwining animals forming a full figure eight design, which is symbolic of everlasting life. And a sarcophagus is a Greek word. It means flesh eater, because the bodies were allowed to decompose inside over time until only the bones would remain. And they were quite often taken out and then placed elsewhere. And inside the sarcophagus are two holes carved. These are called soakage holes, which would let all the fluids and the gases from decomposition to escape and prevent the sarcophagus from cracking. As we walk through the graveyard today, you will notice that some of the graves are very new. Now, people are still being buried on site here today, but there are very strict guidelines as to who can be buried here. In the 1930s, there was a view to closing this graveyard because the site was not that suitable as a graveyard. It was built on solid rock and some of the graves were very shallow. But before this was done, it was decided to give families from the town of Cashel an opportunity to be buried up here. So a register was opened in 1930 and it's only the people on the register who can be buried on site. There are about five or six names left on this register and once these people are buried here, that will be it. The register will be closed and there'll be no more burials on the Rock of Cashel. Scully's Cross was erected in August 1870 by Vincent Scully. He was extremely proud of the end result and in particular the stone door, an influence borrowed from ancient Egypt. The total height of the cross is in excess of 50 feet. The stone came from Portland and every panel had significance. The top of the cross was lost in a storm in 1976, but despite this, it still attracts considerable attention. We're standing inside the ruins of St. Patrick's Cathedral, a Gothic structure built between the year 1230 and 1270. High pointed arches, which really represent the Gothic influence, which became the predominant style in Europe from about the 13th century on. The cathedral itself is cruciform form in its plan. Choir area behind me, a nave area, and then north and south transept. The nave area was very much drastically shortened. Uh, in the 15th century with the construction of an archbishop's residence for defensive purposes here on the Rock of Cashel. And in the north and in the south transepts, the lancet windows were shortened with the introduction of stained glass. Prior to that, the long lancet windows would have been covered predominantly with animal flesh or animal membrane, which would let have let in a lot of cold, damp conditions, making life very, very unfavourable here in St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Rock of Cashel. In the cathedral here in the Rock of Cashel, we have these wonderful examples of carved stone heads. It's so easy to be impressed by the vastness and splendor of this cathedral that one could so easily miss the finer details. Just above me here, I'm standing uh, under some wonderful examples of such sculptures. It is believed that these may represent donors to the construction of the cathedral or indeed the heads of mer wealthy merchant families who lived in the town of Cashel. Much remains to be explored of these impressive symbols of Gothic architecture. Okay. So we're standing here in front of the tomb of Myla McGrath, the most notorious Archbishop Ireland has ever known. And he was born in 1521, and at the age of 18, he went to Holland, became a Franciscan friar, returned to Ireland. And then he tricked the Pope into making him Catholic Bishop of Down and Connor, which was a huge province up, or a huge parish up in northeastern Ireland. Now, he was Catholic Bishop up there for about 10 years, when eventually he decided that he didn't want to be there anymore. So he went to England, introduced himself to Elizabeth I, and we always like to say here on the rock that she fell in love with him because 
Elizabeth was always partial to a good-looking man, and Myler was drop-dead gorgeous. He was over six feet in height, he had long dark curling hair, huge dark eyes, a melodious speaking voice, and at a time when men wore hose, he had a beautiful pair of legs. And Elizabeth was so taken by him that in 1571, she made him Protestant Archbishop of Cashel. Now, he was a pluralist, because while he was Protestant Archbishop in Southern Ireland, he was at exactly the same time the Catholic Bishop in Northern Ireland. And this went on for several years, and it eventually led to his excommunication by Pope Gregory XIII. Myler didn't care. He continued to keep pigs in his cathedral. His clergy was illiterate. And at a time when most people were dead by 36, because famine and warfare made true of that, Myla McGrath, who survived two murder attempts in his life, he died of natural causes a few weeks shy of his 101st birthday, leaving, it said, two wives and nine children. So, he was a great Irishman. The Leper Squint is a small rectangular window located here up on the chancel of St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was built by David Latimer, who was the Seneschal of Cashel in 1230. It was built for the lepers of Munster, specifically anyone down in the hospitals that would have been built down in the town as well, so they could watch mass from that window. The window is also commonly referred to as a hagioscope, but within the annals of Cashel history, it is always referred to as a leper squint. Leprosy arrived in Ireland as early as the 10th century on the back of Viking ships and the disease did not disappear from Ireland's history until the 16th century where it had left its mark in the form of places being named after the leper colonies or the hospitals treating them. Leper hospitals were built throughout the country to treat those afflicted with the disease with over 40 being built in Munster. With the permission of the Archbishop Marianus O'Brien, Sir David Latimer built a leper hospital to the south of the town's walls and placed it under the care of the Cistercian monks of Hoare Abbey. Both the hospital and the leper squint were built by Latimer in 1230 as his daughter was afflicted with the disease and was to be treated in that hospital. The window here at the rock is one of the five noted within the country, making it a rare and interesting find. So the Vicar's Choral, uh, a building that was created for the choir that was introduced by the Archbishop Richard O'Hedian in the early part of the 15th century. They were lay people that were employed by the Archbishop to sing at church ceremonies. This room was their practice area. Uh, next door is a dormitory where they would have slept overnight. And they also had a general reception area for visitors to the site. Keeping this in mind, it made sense when the Office of Public Works were restoring the building back in the 1970s that it would serve as a visitor centre for people visiting the site. They'd be able to see a little bit of the background and the history of the rock before going out to see the site for themselves. Um, the building is one of a kind in Ireland. It's the only complete Vickers Coral complex that remains in the country. And it has its distinctive ogie headed windows on the outside as well that are uh, a, a feature that is really associated with the 15th century in Ireland. Behind us here on the Rock of Cashel is a Tower House residence. Uh, it's attached onto the cathedral. It's highly unusual to have a uh, Tower House residence attached to a religious building. So that is unique about this site here on the Rock of Cashel. Tower Houses were residences uh, all over the countryside, mainly for security. So it's interesting the Archbishop at the time, Mr. Hedian, had decided to incorporate security onto his site. And it's also interesting that there's a religious connection with the said building. When in the 1870s, the site was now abandoned, that the stonework was used to build a stone chapel in a place called Watertown, Wisconsin. And that site was at St. Bernard's, where the original timber structure was built in the 1840s. So in 1873, some of the stone of this building was transported across the United States and the stone building stands as a link with the Rock of Cashel to this day. Thank you for watching our virtual tour of the Rock of Cashel. 